Welcome to Get the Balance Right, a podcast for creative entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Heather Zeitzwolf. Learn how to run a more profitable, purpose-driven business through my conversations with thought leaders, CEOs, and renegades in digital media, marketing, advertising, and design. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Get the Balance Right podcast. I am your host, Heather Zeitzwolf. Today's show is the second installment of my sales series, My guest today is the outspoken and funny Max Landisman. He is the host and creator of the YouTube business show, Maxin TV. His area of expertise is lead generation and sales. If you missed last week's episode, our guest was Nikki Rausch, also known as the sales maven, who is a sales coach and expert. Now, if you listen to that episode and compare it to this one, you will notice that Max and Nikki have different approaches to sales, yet they are both phenomenal in what they do. I hope you find this as fascinating as I do, but despite their differing styles, they share some key selling methods. They both listen to their prospects and truly understand their pain points. Listening is key. It's this act of being an empathetic listener that I think is the key to both of their success. When you're selling from a place of empathy, your mind shifts. Rather than focusing on closing the deal, when you're listening, you're learning about what problem they need to solve. If you as a seller can truly solve their issue, then you are no longer trying to convince the prospect to buy. Instead, you're just explaining your resolution. Now, it sounds easy, right? Well, listening is a skill. Think about all those times when someone was talking and you're just like, ugh, I want to just blurt out the answer. I know the answer to this. But if you continue to listen, probing deeper, you are more apt to get to the real root of a problem. I have a hard time with this. I love to blurt out the answer. If you have to say something, probe further. To develop this skill, you can use an empathy map. I've included a link to one in the show notes that I created. The empathy map is a visual interactive method for unlocking what really matters to your prospect or client so that you can solve their problem more effectively. This tool will force you to listen for key pieces of information. Okay, in case you've never seen an empathy map, Here is how it works. The empathy map is broken into different areas where you gather information through listening and probing to get a deeper insight on the issue. There's four areas at the top and two at the bottom. The top areas consist of the following. One, thinking and feeling. What does the prospect or client think and feel? Are they confused? Frustrated? Feeling hopeless? What are the emotional drivers? The second one is hear. What does the prospect or client hear? Who influences them? Who do they speak to when making a decision? Number three, see. What does the prospect or client see? Where are they? What's their environment? Four, say and do. What does the prospect or client say and do? What are they telling you? What are they doing? Are they saying one thing but doing another? That's the top area, are these four. Thinking and feeling, hear, see, say and do. Okay, there's a bottom section of the map. This is where you're going to write in the pains and gains. Pains. This refers to their biggest problem and challenges. Stick to three or less. Gains. What are the benefits and opportunities in solving the pain, such as... Maybe your client could take their kids to Disneyland. Maybe they can sleep in in the mornings. Maybe they don't need to read long reports. Whatever pain that you're solving, what is the gain that they will get as a result? To use the empathy map, you can either collect the information while you're on the call or take notes and fill it out afterwards. If members of your team were involved in the call, ask them to fill out the empathy map as well Or you can create a large-scale one on a whiteboard, and then your team members can participate with sticky notes. You can also do this virtually. I like the tool Moreau, which I can share a link in the show notes. You can learn so much more if you take the time to listen and observe. 
To fill out the empathy map, you should fill out the top section first. Really reflect on what the prospect or client told you. What feelings did they share? What types of values did they convey? And did they say things that were contradictory? If you were on a Zoom call or an in-person meeting, what was their body language? How about their facial expressions? What about their voice inflections? You can collect this information into the empathy map while you are on the call or take notes and fill in the map afterwards. Okay, now on to our guest, Max Landisman. I had a blast talking with him. He is a fast-talking entrepreneur with an MBA from New Jersey with a booming personality. All right, are you ready? Here is our conversation about lead generation and sales. Max Landensman, welcome to Get the Balance Right podcast. I'm excited to have you on the show today. Absolutely. I really appreciate you having me on. For the people that don't know about you, can you just tell a little bit about yourself and what makes you tick? Uh, everything makes me tick. I, I'm in New York. If someone looks at me the wrong way, I tick. No, but on a realistic level, what makes me tick are just not knowing how to sell, come across salespeople all the time. And from one salesperson to another, if the guy's doing a horrible job trying to sell me, I actually will stop because I've heard every script in the world. I'm like, I know they're reading off something. I pause them for a second. I'm like, listen, relax. I really do want to hear about what your product is. Talk to me like a person from heart to heart. Tell me why your service or product is so good. And I'm going to bring up all these different questions and things. And whether we end up working together or not, I always leave them off with a tip. Going forward, just make sure that you think about every possible resistance, a question that someone will bring up before you get on a call. So that when you get on a call and someone brings up a question, you already know what to do. I would definitely say that would be the number one thing that makes me tick, but it I try to twist it and make it a positive. You've already jumped right into the topic, which we're going to talk about sales. Before we get more into sales, because I love this topic too, tell us just a little bit about yourself. I saw that on LinkedIn, you have an MBA. Yeah, the reason why I have an MBA, I have ADHD. And for business people, we go for the MBA because we can't actually spell Masters of Business Administration. So we go straight for the MBA. But it was a great, just the setting, just where I was in life. I was already in the private sector for four or five years. And I knew that getting an MBA, it takes time, it takes money. This was a great opportunity for me to do it. I was still living in Florida, so I was able to go to a great college in Nova Southeastern University, probably the most underrated business school in the country. The reason why I say that is because a lot of people who might go to a fancy MBA program, I don't know how many of those professors actually were in business. They might have wrote articles things of that nature. Every single one of my professors were extremely successful business people. For example, the first professor I've ever had, he sold his business for $120 million. This is a guy that I want to listen to. And the next guy, my international trade professor, whenever a big brand wanted to expand internationally, they call this guy. These are the types of people that I want to hear from. These are the types of people that I was able to learn from. And plus, I was able to do it and not be in debt. I don't believe in going into debt for school. So it was a great opportunity for me. I really did learn a lot. And I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm a school person. I happen to love this business school. It was great. It was very practical. It was a great experience. Wow. Okay. I'm going to have to put their information in the show notes for sure. You mentioned Florida. I used to live in Florida. And I think on your LinkedIn, I also saw something about a cycling company or something. Were you involved in a cycling company? Yes. My twin brother and I did start. It's called Cycle Trail. That was a very interesting experience. That was our first taste into e-commerce. And as opposed to taking a course or anything like that on stuff, I just do it. And whether I'm successful or unsuccessful at it, I learned a ton and I actually figured out how to do it. And yes, we were selling women's bicycling, cycling accessories for a while. What makes the female accessories? Definitely the color scheme and the sizing. It was actually very interesting that if you were to look on Amazon, I don't know if it's currently like that, but... At the time that what we were doing it, that if you were to actually type in woman cycling gloves on Amazon, you'll see just a bunch of random gloves. You'll scroll through the list. Everything is dark. Everything's dark. There's no design. You would hate it. Absolutely hate it. You would love our gloves because there's some personality to it. There's a design to it. And it's definitely very different than what was in the marketplace. So we thought that we had a little niche going and that's what led us to that. That's very cool. I got pulled in by pink boxing gloves. I actually bought a pair of boxing gloves because they were pink and I was going to box, but yes. Anyways, the pink cycling gloves sound more up my alley. Pink polka dot gloves. 
Appreciate it. Cool. Okay. That's awesome. Great to hear about your background. And so let's dive into this topic. So we're going to talk about lead generation and sales, both on LinkedIn and in person. Probably going to talk a little bit more about virtual sales as well. But what is your first thing you want to tell us about lead generation? In today's day and age, I think that there's so many quote unquote softwares out there and I'm not knocking anybody, but the software is fine. But I think what people are getting at it is that if you somehow spam a hundred people a day on LinkedIn, that that somehow will turn into business. That cannot be further from the truth. How many messages do you get a day? Hi, I sell insurance. You want to buy my insurance? No, I don't want to buy your insurance. Why would I want to buy your insurance? The way that I like to come about it is, is that you can still have an automated system where you outreach to people you send connections to. But I like to go from the perspective of, hi, I'd like to connect, so on and so forth. Once they connect, they'll send a follow-up. Thanks for connecting. Have a great day. Leave it at that. If someone responds, yeah, thanks so much for connecting. Have a great day as well. That's what the automation does. Now comes the human connection, which is where we really excel at. You're able to take a conversation that goes from, thanks so much for connecting to where do I sign? Once that happens, once someone already message back saying, have a great day or something like that, nice connecting, you look through the profile and if that person matches what you feel like you can actually help them, as opposed to saying what you actually do, ask them what we call a probing question, which is at the time we were going after resume writers. Let's say a resume writer started five months ago. So I would ask a question like, I see you just started your resume writing business. How's it going so far? He or she can say, well, it's been going great so far. Everything's been doing well. I've been having lots of business. I would be like, great. And I realized that is not someone that we could potentially service. However, if someone's like, well, you know, it's coming slow. It's been hard getting people. Bingo. Once someone identifies that they could be your customer, that's when you throw the hook on them and say, that's so funny. I actually help resume writing clients do just that. I actually have a few ideas for you. I have 10 minutes tomorrow at five. Is that good for you? Something like that. They're a lot more willing to engage with that. That's how we kind of book calls. It doesn't take long. It's not like you're having this four day long conversation. This could happen really quick, but it's a, just a different perspective as opposed to just saying what you do and hoping someone responds. So you're opening up some sort of communication loop with them by asking some kind of probing question and then seeing if they fit what you're looking for as far as the ideal prospect. Exactly. One thing I wanted to add was that if you're selling a more upscale product, like what I sell now, for example, it could cost, let's say four or $5,000. You might not necessarily want to sell them that second, but you can say, let me come up with a proposal for you and let me send it over for you. Because now if you do that, they're going to think that you're really putting in a lot of time, which you have, I would recommend for like higher end products like that. Maybe not necessarily sell them on the first call, but maybe on the second go around. If you are selling somebody that higher scale item, would you recommend that rather than just sending them the proposal and just like you send it out into the ether and you just hope that they're going to reply, would you schedule another appointment to go over that proposal with them step by step? That's a very interesting question. One of the things that I love to do when I'm on a sales call, and if we have to schedule another call, I number one, ask them something I think most people don't ask. I'm like, besides for going through everything, someone will always say, yeah, I love it. Great. Whatever it is. I'll ask them, was there anything you didn't like? Once you ask that, there is a chance that they might not like something, but they don't want to tell you. They'll probably tell it over to their spouse later on or their friend, but maybe not necessarily you. They just want to get off the phone so that when you send them an email, they're probably not going to respond. But when you're at the end of the call and you ask them, was there anything you didn't like? Believe it or not people start to get real. That's when the real conversation begins because they tell you it's a little expensive for me or is this really going to work? And now the conversation is more on a deeper level, not necessarily like a match.com type of level, but a little bit before that. But you're talking for real. You're addressing the real main concerns. And once you get over that, they're like, oh, okay, that addressed that question. You've already saved yourself a week of trying to get in front of them again. And they're like, why don't we schedule a call? How about Friday at 10 o'clock? Is that good for you? And I try to make sure that I schedule the call on the phone and then I'll just send them a calendar invite so they get reminded. 
And that's how I go about doing it. For your selling, do you mostly do it over the phone or do you in person right now, obviously is like a weird thing, but do you ever use Zoom or is it mainly phone calls? Mainly phone calls. I'm open to anything anybody wants to do a Zoom I'm fine with, but mainly phone calls. What about the whole thing with price? When you have that initial conversation to make sure that they're actually even going to buy your product or service, do you try to bring the price subject up even if they've never asked about price? I typically don't say price until the very end, unless they specifically ask for it. I don't like answering what the price is before they understand what you're bringing to the table. Because no matter what you say, you can say it's free. If it's a dollar, why am I giving you a dollar? I don't know what I'm getting. According to them, you're getting nothing. They've immediately checked out. I typically don't like to answer price immediately. I'll say every person is different. Give me a few minutes. Let me explain first and we'll go over the pricing at the end. And they'll be like, okay, sure. No problem. I feel like it's very important to give over your value before you give over price. Okay, that makes sense. What about giving people different options? You Do you like to give people like, okay, I have a three-tiered pricing scheme or I have these different types of services or do you just give them one price item? For me, it's pretty straightforward what we offer. But if someone offers different types of things, the way I like to go about it is that you as the sales professional who has been asking them a bunch of these questions and really getting to the core of their business and really understanding what their needs are, you as a professional salesperson, you can say over what you offer, but I think this is good for you because of X, because if you're just going to just lay out like 15 different options, which one do you want to pick? Chocolate, vanilla, strawberry with sprinkles, without sprinkles, it gets too confusing. People forget. What do you want? What do you do again? I think if you can keep it straightforward, very simple, that works the best. As a sales professional, I think if you just give them the recommendation, I think this will work for you. This is why I think it'll work for you. You need X, Y, Z. This will cover all those things. How does that sound? That's why it's so important to really listen to what the client wants and what their pain point is so that you can tell them what they need. Very cool. What about the whole human connection part of it? Now, I can't stand when people contact me on LinkedIn and they have no idea what I do, but they act like they do. And they obviously never even read my bio. And then they just automatically try to sell me something. Obviously, you're saying not to do that. So beyond that first connection, do you feel like people should try to make a little bit more of an effort to connect with you? Or do you think it's the one time opening the loop is probably good enough? The beauty of it all is there's a bunch of different ways for different types of industries. For example, if you're going after HVAC people, they may not be on LinkedIn as much as a resume writer would. So there's always a different strategy for everyone. But I always say you automation can only take you so far. And unfortunately, I do think a lot of these services and again, like their service is great. But I think that one of the big things that people are just not understanding is you can't just spam people and immediately think that somehow is going to get you business. I think that's the way these services market themselves, that we can just keep feeding you leads by saying blanket statements that I sell insurance. You want to buy my insurance? You know, people always say it's a numbers game. So they think it's the same thing here. I totally disagree. For me, the way that it's been working for us, at least, is to initially just connect say it's nice to connect, have a great day, stuff like that. And then just simply ask a probing question. It seems to me like that's what's been working for us. I tend to lean towards that to make that connection. And again, that's only to lead you on a call. And once you get on a call, you also have to know how to talk to someone. It's just half the battle. That's just the lead generation part of it. Now, once you get them into a sales conversation for your business, do you usually set up like some sort of discovery call or how do you go about that next conversation? You're referring to how to get them on the phone or what you do on the phone? Well, let's talk about both then. Yeah. Once someone identifies on their own that they're a potential client, that's where we will come in. That's where the sales pitch is supposed to happen. Once someone clearly identifies that they could be a client and we know that we can help them, and it's not just we know that we can help them, we are super confident that we can do this. We know everything about their business. We know how resume writers typically operate, whether they told us or not. We have an understanding of how the industry works, what the prices are, things of that nature. So we're able to communicate that in a conversation, whether the person said that they were doing well or not as well, even in the beginning, we can still carry a conversation. And our job is to simply just ask them questions, just ask them questions about their business. You simply listen. Once someone identifies that they're a potential client, we simply just say, 
That's so interesting. I happen to specialize with resume writers that were able to get them consistent leads. On average, we get them between 10 and 30 leads a month, whatever, fully guaranteed. I actually have a couple ideas for you. If you have a few minutes next week, here's my calendar link and they just click and they set up a call as far as like setting it up. And once you get on the call, you again, have to know how to talk to someone. Once you're on the call, you're just asking them questions. You're not pitching them. You're not doing anything. Tell me about your business. Tell me about yourself. How'd you get into this business? Let them talk. They keep talking. And sooner or later, you're going to ask a question such as, so it seems like you're having trouble getting clients. Is that correct? Yes. And once it's become super clear, they have an issue. We can help them in this issue. And that's that. But it's not even just like I'm pushing something. They're self-identifying on their own. And I'm just here to listen and to offer my service to them and to help increase business for them. At that point, we have roughly between a 50 and 70% conversion rate. A lot of the times when someone says you're too expensive or whatever it is, to me, it's never about the money, actually. It really is, in my personal view, there is always going to be like that 1% where someone really just doesn't have the money. But I, in my personal view, 99% of the time, even if someone says it's not about the money, it, it is about the money. It's honestly, I feel that you did not convey how the value that you bring to this person. For example, if someone really believed that you can get them business, that you can help them make more money, why wouldn't they invest? Why wouldn't they invest in their cell? They're hesitant on doing it is because they feel that you may or may not be able to do it. One of the things that we were able to offer were full guarantee. If we don't do our job, if we don't do what we say we're going to do, you get your money back, period. That's the end of the story. Because we're super confident that we're able to help them. Once someone hears that, I think it's really just a slam dunk because there's nothing for them to lose. So during this first initial call, you're probing the client or potential client, the prospect, and then looking for those pain points. And then once you pinpoint the real pain points, then you want to show how you can give them results. Exactly. And if you can't convey how you will give them the results, you probably aren't going to get the sale. A hundred percent. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Hey there, this is Heather. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And if you are, if you wouldn't mind, please hit the subscribe button now. That way you'll never miss an episode. All right, now back to the podcast. I guess there's different ways of thinking about this whole conversion rate, because what I have heard is that if you convert too many, too high of a percentage, then your prices are too low. But you're saying it doesn't have anything to do with price. It really has to do with results and how you convey those results. Yeah. I mean, we were definitely charging. We were charging market average. If not, I believe we were the only one actually offering that guarantee. Typically, someone would charge, let's say, 700 we were charging 600 for this. You could potentially even charge a thousand. We weren't necessarily charging to be the cheaper option because we don't care about being the cheaper option. We had a goal. We wanted to hit 30 clients. Once we had 30 clients paying, let's say $600 a month, that was our goal. And so it didn't matter whether we, whether we were charging 700 or 600, we were simply just going for the goal. It happened to be 600. It happened to be maybe slightly lower than most, but it's still $600. I remember speaking to someone, someone said they were talking to somebody who's going to do it for 500, but yet went with us because we offer the guarantee. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's incredible. So did that guarantee ever backfire on you or were you always, that's always seems like that's a kind of a, it's a gamble. Do you give people a guarantee? Are they going to abuse that or how did that work out for you? That's a fantastic question. So it was working fantastically. We were doing very well. But sometimes we took on a client maybe too early that maybe we should have filtered out certain people. Even if someone wants to be our client, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good fit because we say very clear in the beginning that the first two weeks are really just to see what's working, see what's not working, fix the tweaks, things like that. But if someone's panicking within the first week and saying, why don't I have 15,000 leads, then that's not a good client. Unfortunately, we needed to do a better job as to filter out certain people for sure. And as to the guarantee for a business, our job really is to feed people leads. That's our job. If someone gets a bunch of leads, but can't close on the phone, I do offer sales training as well, which I've done very successfully for one of our first clients, but not necessarily for another client. 
he's been getting a ridiculous amount of leads, but wasn't able to close them. It's still under that guarantee. And we still technically would have to give back his initial investment. So in this case, yeah, it's a little bit of an abuse of power type of deal. So we're definitely going to tweak that as to guarantee the leads, meaning we can only do what's in our power. At the end of the day, we feed people the leads, but they need to close. We can't literally baby someone to to literally hold their hand. Into, I can't get on the phone and close that person. They're going to need to do it themselves. So that's definitely one thing that we, sh- we should have changed from the beginning, but you live and learn. Exactly. Well, I guess that's part of being an entrepreneur for sure. What are, Do you have any other types of things that you've lived and learned over the years doing this? I've been in sales my entire career, essentially. I know it's a short-lived career. I'm 27 years old. People say I can sell ice to Eskimos. This was not always the case. I learned the hard way. I've done everything you could have imagined a salesperson would do. I actually walked into a grocery store and I told the owner, that time I was working for a company called Macmore Capital. It was a settlement recovery business. There was a big settlement with Visa and MasterCard. Anybody who accepted credit card is owed back money. By the way, that's still like that today depending on how much volume you've done and how many years you've done it. So I went into a grocery store figuring they do a lot of volume of Visa MasterCard. I went straight to the owner. I I don't care. I could cold call the queen of England for all I care. So I walked in and I told him, I know you think I'm nuts, but trust me, you're going to want to hear what I have to say. And he's like, okay, shoot. The conversation went from get the hell out of my office to what the hell, who the hell is this guy? And I remember... I was wearing my Mets armband and he goes, he's like, by the way, are you a Mets fan? I'm like, yeah, he's like, I grew up a huge Mets fan. And this is what actually landed me the deal. So I've done that door to door. You can't even imagine. I remember cold calling from my dorm room, doing something, selling custom suits. I even walked door to door to certain hotels, like fancy hotels in Chicago, where I went to undergrad. I've done it all. And I was just fed up with my inability to sell at the time. I literally had to learn from scratch. And I was able to get some great mentors. My dad was in sales. He was in wealth management. His entire career was based on commission and he was really successful. I learned from him. He gave me some great audio books to listen to. Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale is probably the greatest audio book I've ever heard. Life-changing stuff. And ever since then, I coach sales at this point. So it's been a whirlwind of a ride for sure. Some people, they feel like, oh, I don't feel comfortable doing sales. They think it's pushy or sleazy. Do you think that doing sales, if it comes from a place where you feel like you're offering something that this person needs, then it doesn't seem like it's sleazy at all. You're not trying to pull a fast one on someone, but still people feel uncomfortable. Do you think you have to have a sense of confidence or where does this place come from? You seem like you're comfortable doing it. Yeah, I'm so confident in my ability to sell because I know that what I'm selling is great, like freaking fantastic. And I know that it works and can really help people. But it was not always the case that used to sell something I didn't necessarily agree with. I worked in, let's say, a high-end suit store. I thought these suits were garbage. I didn't think it was worth the money. I had a hard time selling it because I didn't believe in it. I think one of the biggest lessons that I've ever learned in sales is I recommend not selling anything you do not believe in. Find something that you truly believe in. And I don't even think you even need sales skills in particular. If you really believe in something, you're able to sell it. My brother, I have a twin brother actually, he's a data analyst by trade and nobody would actually confuse him with a salesperson. He's not as outgoing as I am per se, but he's my partner. And so selling linked automation, things of that nature is very easy for him because he believes in the product. I don't think you need unbelievable sales skills to be able to sell something. You just have to believe in what you're selling essentially. And you mentioned LinkedIn automation. Is that the name of your business? It's called linked automation. Linked automation. Okay. So tell me what is linked automation? What is that about? Yeah. I remember my brother came up to me with this opportunity, this idea that there's this platform on LinkedIn called ProFinder. So ProFinder, for those of you who don't know, it's LinkedIn's platform where they connect service providers with people looking for a specific service. And so resume writers are the number one most demanded service on that platform. You can just see a lot of people unfortunately lost their jobs. So obviously resume writing is number one on the list. And one of the big challenges for resume writers is they're not salespeople and they have a very hard time getting in even in front of people 
closing on people, things of that nature. And so my brother came to me and he had this idea that we're able to offer a service that will literally feed people leads and get them a lot of business. And everything is done through ProFinder. We have this proprietary system that can get someone essentially on the top of the list. So the way it works is it's based on geographic location. And so when a job gets posted, that person, it usually starts within a 50 mile radius. So if someone's in Miami Beach, let's say, they posted a job for resume writing and the resume writer is in North Miami Beach, the job will pop up on their board, whatever, and it's up to that person to apply for that job. The problem is that jobs come in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It comes in all the time. You would have to essentially be glued to your computer. And LinkedIn maxes out at five applications. So once someone hits five applications, you're out. If someone types in anything on Google, you're typically looking at the first few things on Google. You're not going to the second or third page. It's the same thing with this. The person who gets on the top, meaning the person who applies for the job first, according to our data, they have a chance of getting the job twice as much as anybody else. We were able to get people on the top of the list, giving them an advantage essentially to get those jobs. We would literally craft a great proposal for these people we have a copywriter on hand and we just keep feeding people leads for resume writing career coaching and that's how the business started do you mainly just work with resume writers or do you help other folks get leads i actually posted on linkedin today that we've expanded our offering to include mortgage loan originators hvac installers and real estate agents it's a much higher end ticket than resume writing. Resume writing, let's say resume could be three, 400, if not more. Someone installs an air conditioning, it costs between six and $12,000. What is the lead worth to that guy? This is not on ProFinder, it's on Facebook ads. What makes us different is that we're not just advertising on Facebook. We get a data set of a thousand people, let's say, and that's very difficult to get. It costs a lot of money to be able to get that list. And these are people that are not looking for HVAC in a week from now, in two weeks from now, they want it today. Someone who is searching, how much does a new air conditioning cost? And he's been searching for the last month. That person is a high chance that he's going to want to buy a new air conditioning. So we take that list and we put it into Facebook and we're able to make a similar list of a bigger, bigger audience and we target people only looking for that service today. It cuts out a lot of the garbage. You know, when someone clicks on an ad, it costs people money. So we're able to specifically market to people who want the service today, which eliminates a lot of the costs. And we can literally pinpoint how much a lead would cost someone, what on the low end, on the high end, how many leads can they expect per month on the low end or on the high end? How much is this going to cost you? And because these people can make so much money on just one client, it makes for a win-win situation for both parties. So it's a lot more lucrative for us, especially, and it's just another ball game. So we're just taking things one step further. Wow. So I work mainly with people that are like creative entrepreneurs. They might be in marketing or advertising. They're always, of course, looking for leads as well. So is this something that anybody could come to you and then you would might roll out some sort of plan that would be more targeted for that type of industry? So if, if anyone wanted to come to me and wanted leads, I'm happy to customize things for them. Depending on which industry they're in, I may or may not be able to offer that guarantee. The industries that I mentioned, I know for a fact, we can offer a guarantee for them. We literally almost pinpoint down to the exact number, how much it's going to cost you, how many leads you're expecting to get. And these are in-market leads, which is people wanting your service today, specifically for HVAC, specifically for mortgage loan originators, specifically for real estate agents. We know 100% that we we can get them leads. We can also do this for lawyers, uh, especially PI attorneys, doctor's offices, dental, but we're doing things one step at a time. So we do cover a lot of different industries. It really depends on who's coming to me, what they need. And I'm happy to have a conversation with them and customize a plan. Wow, that's exciting. So this is taking your talents as a salesperson and then incorporating the bleeding edge of technology and forming this new type of business. That's very exciting. Also with technology, you have a YouTube channel. You do a lot of fun things with your videos. So I'm going to just geek out for a minute. Tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel. And then I'm going to ask you a little bit about some of those videos. 
Yeah, I'm very humorous. I like to joke around almost all the time. I actually just came out with a video about the number one dumbest interview question one can ask. All of my experiences, I've had this whole thing bundled up and I've always just wanted to share it. My brother just pushed me. He's like, actually just got to start the show. And like I do everything, whether I know how to do it or I don't know how to do it, I'm going to start doing it and figure it out. We work backwards. And so I just started the show and one thing led to the next. I was able to get great guests on the show. I got some lighting. I got a nice background. That's how things got rolling. On your show, is it mostly that you're talking to business people? Is that kind of the niche that you have on your show? Yeah, so from the data that I've seen, uh, the person that typically watches my show is a male between the ages of 25 and 34. I really do want to expand on that. I would like it to be open for more people. I think that will be great for your business or if you're an entrepreneur. So it's really geared for a young millennial entrepreneur. Cool. I don't meet any of those demographics. I'm a, a white female, age 52, and I really enjoyed your video. So there you go. You Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> 52 years young, 52 years young. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to geek out a little bit on your YouTube channel. You have the thumbnail for each one of your videos. How are you doing that? Are you using a special program to make those graphics for your videos? As far as editing videos, I had to learn everything on my own, but I did come across a, a software called Camtasia. One of the things that I really liked about it was their offering. It was not a monthly plan. It was like 200 bucks, one time fee, you get it for life. I'm like, as an entrepreneur, this is freaking fantastic. You have to worry about it, just buy it once and you're good. So I bought it and I had to learn the system from scratch and it's fairly easy to use, but I'm always trying to learn and to trying to grow. I consulted one of my friends who's a professional photographer. As far as the thumbnail goes, I bought a service called Thumbnail Blaster. They have these templates where they have these cool thumbnails that you can uh, customize it to what you want, which is what I did. I don't think it's like super, super easy. It did take a little bit to learn, but that's how I came out with my thumbnails. It's called Thumbnail Blaster. I believe it was $67. Okay. These are really cool tips. Do you have any other software that you've maybe recently discovered that you're excited about or? Yeah, I came across this website called Motion Array where if you saw one of my intro to my videos, I couldn't do that on my own. I had to actually hire someone to do it. Thank God for Fiverr, but they did a great job, but I want to learn how to do it myself. And I came across this website called Motion Array. They have all these great, super high quality templates to put in different types of videos or music, but you need to have Adobe Premiere or any of these. And I think for me, it just Adobe is way, way too complicated for a guy like me. So I'm currently looking into those types of things, but it's a work in progress for sure. Yeah, your intro to your videos that I watched must be Motion or some kind of software like that that was used because it's pretty impressive. It seems like they got it from Motion Array, but they either know how to use Adobe or some software that was conducive to them. The person that you hired, you got them off of Fiverr? Yes, on Fiverr. Cost me 50 bucks. No way, really? Oh, wow. I think I need to start using that service. Okay. I know we've kind of already talked about it a little bit, but where do people find you? And we'll have information in the show notes. If people want to chat with you, where can they find you? I believe I'm the only Max Landisman on LinkedIn. So if you, if you type in M-A-X Landisman, L-A-N-D-E-S-M-A-N, -E you'll most likely find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to send a connection request and shoot over a you know direct message. I'm happy to talk. Email phone number, whatever. If you find me on YouTube, I leave a little link to my LinkedIn. You can also find me there as well. All right. Hey, Max, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Absolutely. This was fantastic. And you're as advertised, that's for sure. <laughs> what does that mean exactly? When you haven't met someone first, let's say you see what their LinkedIn profile is, you can get a perception of who they are. Uh -huh. You really hit the nail on the head. Like sometimes I come across people who look totally different on LinkedIn and their personality comes off different in real life. Your personality really came off. It's refreshing talking to someone like you, honestly. Fun. A lot of fun. Thank you. Being that I'm an accountant and I'm kind of a weirdo, free spirit, that sort of thing. It's one of those things where do I tone that down or do I just let my freak flag fly? I had clients, they're creatives. And one in particular, she is like, you need to have your personality shine more. And I was like, okay, so I'm authentic. <laughs> and whoever told you that, I want to give them a big round of applause because they told you correctly. You're If you have a unique personality, I do believe you should shine. You should be who you are. You should be yourself. When I see someone's all like corporate and like full of garbage, I usually will say something so ridiculous to ease them up a little bit. 
because nobody hates corporate more than I do. When I see like someone's not being real with me, I say something so ridiculous, so offbeat on purpose so that they're like, did he just say that? Oh, it's okay to talk for real. I prefer to talk to someone who really is talking to me. That's my style. So keep doing what you're doing for sure. Thank you. And everyone can tune in to Max and TV and check you out. Cool. Thanks again, Max, for being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, this is Heather. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. If you found value in the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave me a rating on iTunes or just simply tell a friend about it. And if you're interested in learning more about my profit advising and coaching, please set up a discovery call by using the link in the show notes. All right. Thanks so much and see you next time. Thank you.